you know, I was always told, do what you love. And uh, I love business, I love entrepreneurship, and I love weed. So it was just a perfect combination. I, I was 13 and it was love at first sight. Like I, I never, my dream, you know, some people want to be vets. Some people want to be doctors and lawyers. My dream was to be a shop, I'm such a Jew. My dream was to be a shopkeep in, in Kensington Market. So the week that I turned 18, I, you know, I found a little crappy place on Kensington Avenue, a little room full of cockroaches, had mice, it was horrible. It's $200 a month and I, I said to my mom, I said, I'm 18. I'm out of here, you know, and I, I took my, my money and I, I booked it all freight. I, I moved down to Kensington. I've, I've, I've been here since. I always say when I started, I was a 19 year old disabled Jewish woman with dreads. Being a woman was like the least of my problems. The hardest part was being 19 and trying to, to convince people that as a young person, I could conduct business so you could give me terms and I'll pay you, I'll pay taxes, I'll do all that adult stuff. You know, I think at first they were a little concerned about sort of what's going to, what is this like new concept that, that this crazy girl is bringing to us, right? They knew me, but they were like, what is Abby doing? She's crazy, right? But now if we didn't exist, a, there'd be probably 200 to 300 less people a day that walk through this community and shop and eat and interact with the other businesses and the other people who live in the community. But then there would also be um, probably 200 more pot, pot smokers sitting out in the park smoking weed, right? So <laughs> there's uh, just because it is a very counterculture neighborhood, that's our clientele. Hotbox now for probably about 15 years, maybe 16 years, yeah. I'm actually a medical marijuana patient, um, and I'm a medical marijuana patient advocate. So places like this actually allow patients to get out of their houses and be social. Um, Abby has been one of the women that's been instrumental to help uh, push us to legalization for recreational people and she's given medical and recreational people a place to vape and smoke cannabis for years and I love her. It's, it's hard sometimes as an activist to be doing, it feels like you're doing all this work with no support, right? Uh, for years, nobody donated money to us and we really had to fight. People thought, oh, they're just gonna steal my money. And it's like, well, we're not stealing your money. We're, we're fighting for your freedom. And if you can't donate a buck or two towards that, then maybe we should stop. But at the same point, you know, I had to keep going. Can't start, not finish. I was um, often overlooked by people new coming in, uh, by people with more money that, you know, coming in and kind of poaching what I've been doing. Um, and also with the old school, like a lot of the guys have just kind of overlooked me. But you know what? 
I feel great and I feel even better for all the people that are here that this party is really for, for keeping us in business and really supporting the hot box and allowing us to be open for almost two decades to serve them. one day to be really, really, really happy because in all honesty, I never thought I would be seeing this day. I've, I've smoked and used cannabis for uh, the majority of my entire life, 41 years. I never thought, and this is going to sound silly, in my lifetime that we would come to this day, which I think is fabulous, besides being a recreational user for 50 years. I've been a medical patient for, um, how long, almost a year, and I'm using this in, as an alternative to medication that was causing me some side effects. I actually have a lot of cannabis dresses and outfits and costumes. Um, part of the reason that I have so many is that over the last 15 years during Prohibition, trying to get the media to talk to you so you could actually get the proper message across was important because they needed a photo op. And very often they would just take a picture of the guy with the biggest joint who would just say, hi, we're here, you know, I'm hi, I'm here, you know, get used to it. Whereas. Um, being able to actually provide a photo op made, gave me the opportunity to talk to the media about the, the issues of medical marijuana and the issues of legalization. So after this week, I have, I have costumes for all of this week, and after this week, all of my weed dresses will go into storage and I will dress like a normal person again. legislation. It's definitely not perfect, but uh, we're on our way there and it's the first day in history towards a great future for us. So yeah. No, I was walking by and I saw this place and uh, I think we, we're going to see a lot of places like this uh, sooner or later. But I don't know about the effects, actually. I would be interested to know what's going to happen in five years, because Canada is the second, second country in the world that uh, has this legalized. And I, there's not much data out there to, to, to be able to guess what the future will look like. But I hope for the best. And the first so many years, it was it was quite easy in terms of uh, regulations because nobody even paid attention to it. It was like so off the radar. But then once we came on the radar, that's when my real activism had to start. It's all about changing that conversation. Once that conversation is changed, you need to be able to follow it up with meetings with politicians and, and go in with sensible policy, right? So since our campaign, Sensible Ontario, was all about uh, making cannabis retail and lounges um, a focal point of the election and then coming in with answers, right? So we had our follow-up meetings. We went in, we gave our policy papers that we submitted and, uh, you know, and then we pitch those, that policy paper to politicians, right? So, and that took years before that of having these meetings and also work with professionals, uh, get professional lobbyists involved in, in your initiative because they know how to get there.
let's look at the gay community and what the gay community had done. They stood up and they said, you know what? I'm, I'm, a, I'm gay, I'm a perfectly normal person, right? So coming out of the, the grow closet, as I like to call it, really changed the laws. I think if we didn't have spaces like the Hotbox and Vapor Central and all the, all the places that followed and then all the dispensaries that opened up illegally and really pushed the, front, the frontier of interaction, um, we wouldn't be where we are today because people would still be closeted. And I think a lot of the the sort of new consumer that they're predicting they're not new consumers at all the seniors and the baby boomers they're not new they're just closeted right so and you know I, you know and there it's not like there's more gay people in the world today than there were 20 30 years ago they're just out And, and drawing attention to medical marijuana for going on now 13 years I've been involved and in, with her doing different events to bring awareness to, uh, to marijuana culture and uh, now we're you know, going into a bigger realm now with the legalization and looking at how we can expand this Canadian vibration all around the world. Cannabis will just be a normal part of everybody's lives in the next 10 to 20 years. Whether we're just buying it in, in food at the grocery store as uh, CBD products or hemp products that are rich in omega-3s, or we're going to be buying um, THC-infused products for, for, for entertainment. But I really foresee cannabis being a part of our everyday lives within the next decade or two. The key to doing business and being a, a good business person and a strong leader is to do it with your brain and, and have everyone just focus on what you have to say and not on how you look or, or who you are. It's more about up here. What's the deal? <laughs>